Okay, today's presentation is slightly different than what you're used to getting from me. And uh, I've, every now and then I like to do one like this. This is actually a case study uh, that was uh, centered around a job that I, one of my graduates did. And uh, But there's some other things I'm going to talk about too. And I really appreciate you guys being here. Uh, Monday's here again. I uh, hope you can get... Oh and, oh, and by the way, at the end there's a little impromptu uh, test which is you know just one of my funky little tests like you don't usually see uh, but everybody knows how important it is to gather all the information whenever you're trying to uh, get the data points you need to decide what's wrong with something you know troubleshooting is a huge part of what we do uh, there's a lot of people out there that are fairly good at changing parts and that's okay because we need those people uh, but at the same time you know, I've run into situations where, um, like for example, one time uh, uh, when I was working in, over there at the Ford dealer, there was a uh, this big system where you would tell the people in the parts room how much oil you wanted. The oil uh, change guys used to say, you know, they'd say, you know, this one guy named Marvin would yell five on the pump a wumpa, and then they, the, the guy in the parts room would push the button and put five on there and then he'd charge it out on whatever ticket Marvin was working on. But occasionally, because some of those guys would be using the same hose, uh, Marvin would call for five and the other oil change guy would have uh, five on the pump too and then uh, they would wind up somehow getting uh, eight quarts of oil, or I mean, or not eight quarts, but ten quarts of oil out of five quart crankcase. And believe it or not, it will fit in there. And uh, I drew a Ranger that had an engine vibration that was just shaking and I was thinking my goodness what is this and then I you know looked at the ticket and saw that they had done an oil change on it and I don't even remember how I arrived at that conclusion I didn't do a lot of work on it before I uh, just basically uh, checked the oil pull the dipstick it's not a bad idea to do that on any vehicle you're working on and the oil was way up the dipstick I mean it was just ridiculous almost you know almost looked to me like it was halfway up the actual dipstick too and so uh, I went ahead and, uh, and drained oil out in the drain pan under the truck. That was in a flat stall. I didn't have a lift because I, you know, lift had a tendency to get in my way when I was doing a lot of drivability work. Um, anyway, I went ahead and drained about half the oil out of it and got it down to where it was at full and that vibration went away. Uh, you know, so basically the whole thing is missing or misinterpreted information can make a job more difficult than it needs to be. And everybody has fallen into this trap. You can fall into the trap of maybe, you know, there's type 1 errors and type 2 errors, you know, where you've already decided you know what's wrong with it and so you move in that direction instead of, and you ignore information that leads you away from your earlier conclusion. You know, this works in just about every kind of discipline. Well, anyway, if somebody else has given up on a diagnosis and, you know, if, then they tell you this is what I found and this is what I think is wrong with it. It's always a good idea to go and check the way you would if you were the first guy that was looking at it. Store what they told you in a place so that you can look, refer back to it, write it down on the back of the work order or whatever, and then say, okay, that's what he said he thought was wrong with it. That's why he thought that. Now I'm going to go in here and I'm going to do my own diagnosis and see if there's anything that I can find that he has missed. Now what really gets annoying is when you get into some of these electronic situations where your scope's not telling you anything, your scan tool's not telling you what you need to know, and here you are to the point in the in the shop manual matrix where it says try a known good part, and you're talking about a $900 engine controller, which is kind of ridiculous, but you know, whenever you've got so many electronic boxes on there, uh, it's really easy to misfire. You know, there's been a few times whenever I would just be absolutely certain that it was something that was related to the engine controller and I thought I had checked all my inputs and outputs and grounds and powers and pin fits and all that and and then I would find out that I had missed something after going to all of this trouble to try to make sure that I was getting it right you can still miss something uh, no matter how hard you try and if you're like me you back up and you analyze how did I miss this and how can I prevent this next time you know because a lot of the jobs you're doing you may just see that one once a year or something like that or it may be a a make that you don't often see. Well anyway, some mechanics hope for a silver bullet. What they're hoping for is that somebody, and I used to, I don't know how many times I've had some of these other guys that would come over and get me and say, can you tell me what I need to do to fix this? 
you know, and basically they just needed to gather information and find out what was wrong. Um, <laughs> you know, I think I told you about that one guy that uh, he walked over there, and occasionally I would have a silver bullet for him, and I typically would give it to him. The person that gets the silver bullet, though, is not better off in the long run because he didn't own his troubleshooting skills. Okay, so anyway, this guy comes over and he says, I'm having trouble getting this ranger to idle like it's supposed to. And, you know, a lot of, at the time we were having a lot of those with dirty throttle bodies and idle air control motors and all that. And I said, wash out the idle air control motor, wash out the throttle body. Uh, and somebody had been fooling with the idle stop screw, you could tell. And I said, set this idle, unplug your idle air control and set your idle stop so that it's run out at about 500 RPM. Plug your, you know, let get it out of the dead band. Plug your idle air control back in, let it learn. You know, have your battery terminal pulled off while you're doing all this other stuff. But then when you put it back on, crank it up, let it run. If anyway, I told him exactly step by step what to do. And uh, so he was saying, uh, he said, well, he said, I'm, uh, this this took care of this truck. You must have run into this before. And I said, no, I never have. I just did that off the top of my head. And he came and grabbed me by the throat, you know. There was another guy, this uh, guy that I knew that was driving a uh, one of these little Comanche, Jeep Comanches. And he said that he was talking to me on the phone just off the cuff, and he said he had he had put some uh, bags of feed in the back of it or something. And whenever it squatted down, the the brake, uh, you know, the part brake cable got over close to the tire, so that the tire weights were hitting the part brake cable. It was going click 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 when he was driving down the road, but it would only do it when he had bags of feed in the back. And I sort of stored that away in the back of my mind. It's a good idea to listen to what people are saying and remember it. And so uh, the very next day at work, I went and the shop foreman, uh, one of them, he says, get, uh, uh, he gathered a bunch of us guys to sit in this thing and load it up. There was, you know, a guy in each seat in the front, three of us in the back. And we went driving down the road. And he said, he says, when there's a lot of people riding in this, he hears this noise. And I put that together. That's the same noise that Jimmy, uh, the, he's a friend of mine. He's not the same mechanic I'm going to be talking about later. This is the same one. Now, that's the same noise he was talking about, and he actually told me what the fix was. And so I told the shop foreman, I said, "Stop! Stop the vehicle! Stop the vehicle right now!" And so he stopped it, and I got out, and I, I saw where that uh, tire weight had been hitting that part brake cable, and so there was a spring on that part brake cable that was meant to hold that away from there, and it had shifted, and so I shifted that spring so the part brake cable was held away from the tire even when the thing was loaded heavy. And uh, so we drove it, and the noise was gone, and then the shop foreman said, you must have seen this before. And I said, nope, never have. <laughs> and I always drive people up the wall when you figure out something really easy. But, you know, I kind of had a little bit of, a, of an in-line on that because I what I heard the guy talking about the day before. Well, whatever we take on any kind of a troubleshooting job on any vehicle, we have to gather the information we can before we attempt to come up with anything. That's just the way it is before we attempt to fix. All right? And so... What we got going on here, some folks can drive around and listen to a vehicle. This is what I was talking about with that part brake cable thing. Or take a brief look at codes and pins and tell you exactly what's wrong with it because they have seen it before on a lot of vehicles like that. Now you can still misfire on one if you're not careful. Uh, the point is test drives and codes are necessary. But you're going to have to leave the driver's seat sooner or later, open the hood and get your hands dirty. I don't know how many times I would plant a bug whenever I was teaching students over there at the college and I was it would be something they would need to go and find with their hands it was something they absolutely could not look at the scan tool and find but every time I turned around they were sitting they were wanting to sit in the seat with the air conditioner on with the hood closed and look at the scan tool and try to find something that way and using the scan tool and the scope and the other tools that we have are really important but you're going to have to be willing to put your hands on it or you're never going to be able to find some of these problems. And I remember this 92 Chevy C10 350 TBI that had a poor power concern. Nobody had been able to figure it out. And so what I wound up doing, I said, well, I wonder what in the world has, has managed to uh, get this truck to the point to where everybody gave up on it. And so I said, I don't think I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hook this I got this little adapter here hooked up between the fuel filter and the fuel line, hooked the gauge up to it, found out it only had two pounds of fuel pressure. Well, you know those old TBI trucks are supposed to have 12, 14 pounds of fuel pressure, and when they don't have enough fuel pressure, they'll act, they will literally run like the catalytic converter stopped up. So it won't really feel like a fuel filter issue. 
it feels different than with a carburetor if the fuel filter is stopped up or a lot of the other ones. When you get on it and you're requiring a lot of engine power, it starves it for fuel and it cuts out. One time, and uh, I may have told this story before, I can't remember, but I was uh, behind this guy. He was a he was a biker. He worked in the part, I mean, in the uh, new car department at the dealership, and he was driving his Harley, and he was a you know probably a little older than me, and he had worked on his motorcycle quite a bit. And he had a little leather bag of tools and some parts with him in case he needed to work on it. And I saw him by the road working on his motorcycle, so I pulled over and said, "George, what's going on? You need any help?" And uh, he says, "Nah." He says, "I'm." I'm having to change out a coil. He says it was cutting out on me, and I feel like it's probably a, one of my ignition coils is bad or whatever. You know, I'm not a motorcycle mechanic. I ain't never fooled around with any Harley Davidson motorcycles or much of any other kind. Some people have, you know, done all that stuff, but I hadn't. And so uh, I said, "Well, I'm going to stay here and make sure you get going all right," because he was out in the middle of nowhere, you know, 30, 40 miles. And uh, but. Actually, it was that far from work from work to where he went, from work to where I went, was on the same route. And that's the reason we were out there together on about the same time of day. Anyhow, so he put it all back together, and I let him take off. He was ahead of me, and I was listening to his motorcycle. And whenever it started cutting up, and, you know, didn't run quite right, and pulled off side of the road again, uh, I said, "George, this thing's starving for fuel." I said, I can tell by the sound of that engine it's starving for fuel. So George says, well, I don't know how that's possible, but he had one of these little MP glass fuel filters that you take apart and clean, you know, like was real popular back in the 70s. And a lot of people put it on their Volkswagen bugs and all the cute little thing. You can screw it apart and, you know, clean the element and put it back together. And so uh, he, he, he had to, coming out of his fuel tank going through this little glass fuel filter. You see gasoline in there big time. And it was going into his carburetor. And um, I said, George, uh, let's look see what's going into your carburetor here. So I pulled the hose off going into his carburetor, and it barely dripped. It, was, it all shouldn't have been running a straight stream of gas out of that thing. And I said, you know, turn that uh, little valve off of your gas tank. Let's get this fuel filter off here. He said, well, I just cleaned that fuel filter the other day. I don't know what's going on. Well, when we took it apart, I don't know if you've ever taken one of those apart before, but there's a little part that screws on there that retains the filter, and it's got a little sleeve that goes down inside the filter that keeps it centered up. He had screwed that sleeve on upside down so that it was stopping up the hole where the fuel was supposed to go through there. Anyway, we just took that fuel filter apart and put it back together the right way, and he had the motorbike all the way home. And of course, he told the other biker that worked in the parts room in there that I was a motorcycle mechanic, which is a bunch of hard boys because I'm not. But there was another one, this funky little Korean-made motorcycle, I don't remember the brand name, it started with a K, that my friend's son was trying to get going. And it had a strange little fuel pump that had a little diaphragm in it, and it had a vacuum line connected to the manifold, and the pulses in the manifold would bounce that little diaphragm, and that would make it pump fuel out of the tank into the carburetor. It was the strangest thing. And whenever he pulled the gas tank off, for whatever reason, he hooked the hoses up wrong under there. And so I said, that, you know, I don't even remember how I figured that out. But I said, this little thing here is a fuel pump, and it uses pulsations from your, uh, your from your intake stream to bounce a little diaphragm, you know, because I can tell by the way it's piped. And we hooked all that up right, and that fixed that motorcycle too. So I guess I fixed two motorcycles in my whole life, and those were the two. Uh, but anyway, we fixed that truck by... Put a fuel, uh, found two pounds of fuel pressure where we should have found a lot more, and we fixed that one fairly easy by popping a fuel pump and a fuel filter in there. But no problem. Well, when you're the last resort, you know, there's one guy brought his van over there, and he told, and he was talking to him, and they wrote up a little ticket on it. And the the protocols at that dealership were such that, and, and this, I know this sounds screwy and all, you know, and I was always going to uh, make sure that the dealership didn't get the shaft or anything, but this guy brought his vehicle over there and he says this thing has been all over town. Everybody swapped this part and that part and the other part. Nobody's been able to figure out what's wrong with it. And I brought it here last because I figured if I brought it over here, I'd get reamed out. And I says, uh, you know, of course, when they tell you that, that makes you want to fix it real quick. And so all I did was vehicle inspection. I mean, not a vehicle inspection, visual inspection. I pulled the doghouse off of the van and I just, without touching anything, which if you've got a problem that's intermittent or you, you know, uh, aren't really sure 
uh, if you may fix it inadvertently by handling the wire harnesses and stuff, you need to just look with a flashlight and pay attention to what you're doing. And I found over there, and it was fairly easy to see, there was a bracket that was part of his, his uh, uh, 9930 wire harness, I think it was, that was uh, scratching against the uh, engine lift bracket. And so what I managed to wind up doing uh, was I found that, I pull it, when you pull that thing back and you see copper, you know you've got something that's been shortened out, especially if it has shined the place up where it was rubbing against, uh, or if it's against the manifold or something like that, obviously. But anyway, this one here, I pulled it back, fixed the wires, taped it back, tie wrapped it out of the way, and, he, and uh, I just told them to charge him $20, you know, because I, I didn't spend 10 minutes on the darn thing. And, and he said, boy, I sure learned a lesson here. He said, I went everywhere trying to get this thing fixed. I had people swapping parts all over town. He goes, I can't believe I wasted $750, and this is all that was wrong with it. Well, the thing about it is, you know, we can, we can make an easy job hard by overthinking it. And that's what happens a lot of the time. You have an idea that it, it's not always a bad part. Something and Sometimes it's just, they, you know, on these GM wire harnesses, one of this, this GM instructor uh, was saying one time that you unplug some of these wire connectors four times on a GM car and you're going to have pin fit issues. And that's really important to be able, and that's why they sell these little kits where you can check the pin fit on all the pins. And on some of these cars, the old 60 pin processors on the Fords, well they would come out with some kind of a wonky problem. I would, you know, they had those little round split barrel connectors in the engine controller harness. Um, and I would, I would pop that red wedge out of there and I would notice that some of those little split connectors were spread out a little too much and I'd tweak them a little bit so that they were a little tighter and then I would clean it with some electrical contact cleaner and plug that back together and I have fixed more than a few vehicles by just tweaking the pin fit. Now the later ones don't have the little split down the side, you know, they used some connectors that were probably not very good but they had little ones and big ones like that and pin fit on those is incredibly important uh, but always remember pin fit is something that can beat you up, something awful. All right, troubleshooting is 90% of successful repair, but you basically have to think about it in the right way. And uh, I've seen some really, really good troubleshooters in my time. Uh, goes without saying, a surgical repair makes more sense than replacing everything that might be causing a problem, but some problems can have strange and unusual causes. And also there's sometimes, like the one I was talking about two or three weeks ago, that old Thunderbird that hadn't been had any much of any work done to it as far as maintenance goes and it had three or four different problems and every one of them could cause it to stall. If you just fix one of those problems and feel like you know you're trying to save some money for the customer, it's best to go ahead and say, look, every one of these four parts could be bad and cause an engine to stall. You know, if it's the idle tracking switch, the throttle position sensor, the EVP sensor, whatever, so you're going to have three or four hundred dollars worth of parts and some labor to go with it, but you don't want to put yourself in a position to where they're going to come back and say, uh, you know, you didn't go as far as you should have to fix it because that'll get you a comeback all the time, unhappy customers and all that. You know, Lord knows we've got enough trouble with all this stuff anyway with everything that can go wrong with one today. All right, but no matter how much we learn or how long we've been in minutes, sooner or later we're going to find one that's going to beat us up. And that, don't matter, that doesn't matter who you are, you know. I sat in a class one time in one of the a big training events under an instructor and his deal basically was um, I can find out what's wrong with any car in 10 minutes and if you can't you're stupid. That's the way he came across. I'm sorry, it's just, you know, it's not a perfect world and that's all what, not always the way things work. But anyhow, soft skills. If you keep your knowledge to yourself, doesn't make you any smarter than anybody else or more valuable. And there's a lot, I wrote an article about that a, a long time ago, just a little feature piece I wrote about how sharing knowledge is always a whole lot smarter and keeping it to yourself thinking you're making yourself more valuable. Because every time you pause to explain something to somebody else, you gain a little knowledge or you burn things in or you get new ideas that you wouldn't have before you started explaining it. That's one of the reasons when I was teaching students, I would say, find somebody that will listen to you explain this and ask questions and you will understand it a whole lot better for having to explain it to somebody else. And that's one of the reasons that teachers mean they have a, teachers have a tendency to retain 88% of what they teach, but students only retain about 12% of what they are taught. You know. Anyway, 
So Jimmy's a guy that I trained uh, that told me about this transmission situation he encountered on an 01 Power Stroke that was equipped with a 4R100 transmission. Okay, the thing had been to a transmission shop and it was flashing the overdrive light and it was going into transmission limp-in mode and a local transmission shop had rebuilt it, you know, because that's the work, what they like to do. They throw the clutches and the seals in it and we're just going to do all this and then we'll try. But nothing they did fixed it. It was the same situation that they had at the end as it was at the beginning. And they worked, 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 worked on it, put a lot of time into it. And so finally they gave in to uh, the uh, situation and sent it up to the Ford place for, for Jimmy to have a look at it. Now, i got to give Jimmy a plug right here because Jimmy is probably one of the sharpest troubleshooters that I ever trained. This guy right here is really, really good. There's nothing on, that he can't do. And I don't care if it comes to troubleshooting power strokes, electronics, transmissions, different, anything on the car that this that needs to be done, this guy can do it. And he's good at it. And he's fast. And he gets things done in a big hurry and all that. And if, if he calls the manufacturer and says uh, he's got so much clout with the field service engineers and all up at a Ford Motor Company, if he calls them, and his integrity is such that if he says this one needs an engine, they don't even ask for a lot of other information. They just rubber stamp it and say put one in it because this guy says that we know he's telling the truth, you know, and we know he's already done his homework and all. Anyway, if the PCM receives some kind of strange signal, it's out of its expected range, it'll engage emergency protocols because that's what it's designed to do. That's what the algorithms are for. And what they do is, they basically uh, match the severity of the detected fault. In other words, the emergency measures are range from a simple mill light to a shutdown. In other words, whatever it does uh, is going to determine in other words, what it detects. Is, in other words, what can be damaged if we don't do something about this. That's how they type that thing. All of the control solenoids, in other words, it raises the pressure. So basically what we got here if this thing has the idea the transmission is slipping, and this is Ford's not the only one that does this, there's other ones that do it too. Um, if you've got, if it has the idea the transmission is slipping, it will raise the pressure to protect itself from destroying the clutches, because those clutches don't have a whole lot of lining on them. They ain't got to slip very much before they burn up, you know, basically. But the PCM, it does, it measures engine speed, it measures output speed. You know, it's got turbine speed, some of them like intermediate shaft speed. It looks at all those speeds and it knows if it's in gear, it knows if it's slipping, it knows if anything is going on that's not supposed to be between the input and the output, and it makes it takes measures to protect itself from destroying itself. And some of the time, whenever people would be, have a throttle body off of a car that had a throttle valve on it, they would accidentally leave the throttle valve disconnected, which would cause the pressure to be low all the time. You know, when you go deeper into the throttle, it raises the pressure, so that it'll shift firmer, you know, and that kind of thing, and hold gears longer and all that. But people, if you've got a broken throttle, a disconnected or broken throttle valve cable, it will burn the transmission up because it doesn't, and this is the ones that were not electronic, typically. The electronic ones, if they just start to detect a problem, even like a, a slip and torque converter, you know, they'll raise the pressure, you know, set a code, make it shift hard and all that kind of stuff. And the shift hard makes it think, you know, the first time I ran into that, Chrysler stayed away from modulator valves and all that for a long time. I mean, I don't think Chrysler's that I know about ever had a modulator valve of any kind. But the long and the short of it is the older, like a 727 torque flats, they basically had a link up there at the carburetor and it had a spring holding it forward. And whenever you, the more you gave it the gas, the more it would move that throttle valve lever down there and raise the pressure and cause it to hold gears longer and shift harder and all that kind of stuff. Well, if a spring became unhooked on that old Chrysler, that old black Chrysler on that 67 model I drove, that spring come unhooked and that thing would lay back. And whenever you drove it, if you weren't getting on it, if you were shifting, if you were driving it gently, it, it would hold the gears longer and it would shift really hard and it felt like it was going to tear something up. But that's what the, the transmission controller does. It uses the pressure control solenoid to raise the pressure to protect the transmission. So when it goes into limp-in mode, one or more noticeable things it does to raise the pressure to do, protect the clutches from slipping. That's really important. And that revolts in a harsh shift, which is healthier for the transmission than a soft shift that can burn out the clutches really fast. Okay. Now, 
In addition to checking for slippage by comparing the speeds, the PCM will enter limp pin mode if a speed sensor signal is determined to be untrustworthy because in no situation it doesn't know the transmission is slipping or not, so it errs on the side of caution. Now it's doing something similar to what you're doing. You're driving this thing and you're used to watching the speedometer and the tachometer. And whenever you're used to watching those, you can tell if this thing's running faster at a certain speed when you're in drive than it's supposed to. And you can tell something's wrong with the transmission just because you're accustomed to that. Well, the computer is programmed to do that. One of the things that we used to do to see if the torque converter was slipping on some of the Fords back in the late 80s and early 90s, we were told this by the engineers, was you get it in your highest gear with the torque converter locked up and you crowd the throttle a little bit and see if the engine speed gains, I mean, excuse me, the engine speed gains on the vehicle speed. In other words, the engine speed and the vehicle speed ought to go up at the same rate. But if the uh, vehicle's engine speed is going up faster than vehicle speed, then it, that you can tell there's some slippage going on. You don't always know where it is, but typically it would be torque converter in a situation like that. And on those uh, transmissions we had back then, that little O-ring that was on the tip of the uh, shaft out there that was supposed to feed pressure to that uh, lockup, if that O-ring was leaking, it would cause that thing to slip and you'd wind up in situations like that anyway. All right, so you're doing the same thing when you watch the tack and the speedometer that the PCM does, only the PCM has a much tighter tolerance than you do. It's paying a lot closer attention than you are, and it's looking at numbers. You're basically looking at needles. And, but you can feel when something's wrong if you've been used to driving a vehicle. Some people don't even notice, you know. But if you're paying attention, you can tell. All right, so if a gear is slipping, the worst thing the PCM can do is leave the pressure low enough so that it burns up the clutches. We already talked about that. So higher fluid pressure, see here, uh, <clears throat> squeezes the fibers and steels a lot tighter together. It makes them less likely to slip. So it's programmed to reduce current to the EPC solenoid and pressure rises. If you lose power to the elect to the transmission too, if someone like for example, if a, if a dog or something chews the wires and two going to the transmission on one of these, it, the EPC solenoid defaults to high pressure so that it doesn't default to low pressure and burn out the clutches, see, so it's trying to protect itself. Slippage might happen as a result of fluid pressure leak through a cracked or porous casting in the case or a valve body or a piston, stuck valve somewhere, or a shift solenoid mechanical malfunction. Now, Jimmy spoke with a transmission tech that rebuilt the transmission, and he said, uh, gently applying the throttling gear on an incline would bring the problem on, so that's how he managed to duplicate the problem. So he learned it because he'd been trying for two weeks to figure out what the heck was going on, and he knew exactly what it took to make it happen. What are you thinking so far? Some of you transmission guys have probably already got wheels turning in your head. So he duplicated the concern and received a PO720 for a loss of output shaft speed signal. So he went through the data stream, but that was also somewhat confusing because the vehicle speed sensor was reading 127 miles an hour and the output shaft sensor was reading 6,000 RPM with a vehicle sitting motionless in the service bay. Now, uh, this same guy, when he, was, when he was at the school over there, put a transmission back in and he managed to plug the output shaft sensor and uh, the turbine sensor in reversed or something. Either that or the vehicle speed sensor and the output shaft sensor one way or another, and the speedometer was reading really fast and all that. And so he was basically remembering that. But this one wasn't even moving. All right, so he removed the output shaft sensor and inspected the tone wheel with a boroscope and didn't find anything wrong. All right, so the, these hurricane speeds had to be the result of electrical interference. So he decided to disconnect the alternator, this little connector here, and the whole problem went away when he disconnected the alternator. Well, the end of the story was, what do you think? You're thinking about this. What are you going to do? He cleaned the battery terminals, and that's all it took to fix it. Three of the battery terminals needed to be cleaned really bad. Now, they can look really good on these old big beefy ones like these diesels have on them. They can look really good and still need to be cleaned. And cleaning the battery terminals was all that was ever not even important. Anyway, I want to proceed into this little 10-question test here. And what we have is, uh, I want you to look at this and tell me what you think it is. I'm going to back up and go through these again, and we're going to... Uh, do our answers on there. So what the heck is this that I'm looking at here? Can anybody look at that? Uh, if you've done any work on anything like this, you'll know what it is. So we'll talk about that again in a minute. Okay, so what is this measurement called? When you look at this measurement, what do you call that measurement right there? 
okay? All right, so what does this illustrate? If you need to pause this and look at it for a minute, just tell me what this illustrates. What is the purpose of this illustration and what does it mean? Uh, particularly if you read these, this number here and that number there. All right. Uh, what kind of gear set is this? Now, I know it's a differential, but there's another word that I'm looking for. It's a one-word answer. What type of gear set is pictured here? Okay. Now then, what happens if you don't use limited slip additive, you know, the friction modifier that stinks so bad, <laughs> uh, in a limited slip differential? Don't expect to see choices here. You're supposed to know what happens if you don't put that limited slip additive in the gear grease. Number six. Alright, so which one of the parts that you see listed here determines pinion depth? Which one of these parts determines pinion depth? Alright, you might want to freeze that one and look at it a little bit. Uh, which one of these would be considered a pinion gear? Which one of these two gears would be considered a pinion gear? And I just love the way that camera buzzes in and out and loses its focus and all. Look at it. Don't you love it? Okay. Anyway, see what you think about that. You, ought, you should have had a good enough look at it by now where you can tell. Which of these is a differential ratio? Which of these ratios is a differential ratio? Alright. Which of these would give the best fuel economy? What is happening in this illustration? Look carefully at this illustration and tell me what's going on here. All right, now I'm going to back up to the to the first question again. All right, this right here is a set of clutches in a limited slip differential. Of course, there's all kinds of other differentials out there now that are electric and all that. My wife's truck has got an electric, it's got a knob where if you need positive traction, you can turn that knob and you got positive traction, you know. Talk about that again another time. Um, but that is basically, these are the clutches and plates on here. And this they basically are designed so that there will be some resistance, but they can slip when they need to. This one, and this is in between. And they're actually stacked in between the side of the case and the axle gears. Is what, and there will be a spring. There's actually clutches on both sides. And there's a big S-shaped spring, typically, that are in between those that are keeping tension on those so that you'll... You won't have one wheel spinning ahead of the other one when you go to take off in mud or wet grass. Anybody remember seeing My Cousin Vinny and with the talk? If you hadn't seen My Cousin Vinny, you'd really enjoy that movie. <laughs> but anyway, they talk about that in there. Uh, and, you know, what this right here is called lash. That part right there is, is your lash between those two gears. Think about valve lash. In other words, that's how much space before they hit is what lash is basically all about. And like when I was putting a power takeoff on the side of a uh, transmission that had to have a PTO on it, uh, there was basically, you're supposed to do some measurements to determine what the gear lash was so you could put shims, you know, because the deeper you put them gears together, the less lash you're going to have. Also, whenever you move your ring gear away from your pinion, it increases backlash. You know, you can call it backlash, gear lash, whatever. And when you move your ring gear closer to your pinion, it causes, uh, I mean, it reduces lash. Of course, you're supposed to have some lash and not have those gears crammed against one another all the time. However, when it comes to camshaft gears, if you have any lash at all, or if the gears aren't made out of something soft and phenolic, you know, you don't need any lash on cam gears. That's why they have spring-loaded uh, scissor gears on these Toyotas and stuff like that. That's another story, too, if you're talking about engines. Okay, this right here is basically demonstrating how when you go around a curve, one wheel has to go faster than the other one. The differential allows it to do that. The little gears inside here in the middle are what allows it to do that. You might notice that one wheel is going faster than the other one. It only does that because the outside wheel is making a bigger turn than the inside wheel. And you can look at the one that's turning the fastest. That's going to be the outside wheel. These are high point gears. If that, if, on the ones that you might have, if you ever see and you look these up, if it's coming in right on the center, 
you know, that's a lot of the earlier differentials were made that way. But if, if that pinion is coming in below or above the center line of that ring gear, those are hypoid gears. And that's why they have, you know, they got hypoid gear lubricant. Now, that's what hypoid means is that it's coming in below or above the center line on that ring gear. If it's coming in right on the center line, it's, it's a bevel gear, but it's not hypoid. All right. And so this one here, this is what happens if you don't use limited slip additive. When you're going around a curve, those clutches will chatter and it will feel funny it, 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 like that. Sometimes we would get brand new trucks that would come from the factory that they didn't have limited slip additive in. And when you go around a curve, it would feel it jumping and hopping. It's a strange feeling, but that limited slip does that. That same limited slip additive is what they put in automatic transmissions so that whenever they're doing modulated slip of the torque converter going up, you don't have surges and chatters and all that kind of thing. You might have even felt some of these Crown Victorias and they'll feel like you're running over these little warning bumps that you're when you're coming to a stop sign they'll go brrrr, like that and that typically means the transmission needs to be replaced because the friction modifier died and you need to put the you know do a transmission service um, i had to do that on my dad's grand marquee by the way and i've seen it on other vehicles too uh, the part that you're looking for right here that determines your pinion depth is the shim there's a shim it's actually exaggerated in the way that they've got it drawn here but that shim that goes between this bearing and the head of that gear is what determines the pinion depth. You know, of course, this goes way back up in here. So how deep that pinion goes in is determined by what, how thick this shim is between here and, and this bearing. And then, of course, that race is actually going into the case and all that. There's some special tools you're supposed to use to determine how thick that shim is supposed to be. So anyway, there's a lot I can say about that, but I'm not going to go there now. All right, so this one right here is the axle gear because it has spline. That's the pinion gear, and there'll be a little shaft. There's another gear just like it on the other side as part of your differential. Now, which one of these? This is the differential ratio right here. You know, 3.33 to 1. All the rest of these wouldn't qualify as differential ratios. And the one that's going to have this, that's going to give you your best fuel economy is going to be that one right there. And um, I, had a, I had a Ford pickup one time that I... I had 333 gears in it, and it was getting like seven miles to the gallon, and everything else was just like it was supposed to be as a 74 model. Uh, and I got a differential gear uh, chunk. You know, those were that had a chunk differential in them, Rockwell brand uh, style. And I got a from the salvage yard. I got some 275 gears out of a Ford Ranchero and put in there and doubled my fuel economy. Is the only thing I was able to do that truck get the fuel economy from 7 up to 14. I was happy with 14, but whenever, and the reason I did that was because it was back in 1978 when Jimmy Carter deregulated gasoline, it went up to a dollar a gallon. And I was thinking, man, I can't stand paying $20 a, a gallon for, uh, <laughs> or $20 a tank for gas. Boy, I'd love to have that day now. So this is what's happening in this illustration is hard acceleration has torqued that. This is basically torquing because the wheels are turning this way and it's torqued the axle that way and it has caused the spring right here to do that. See, so basically that's the drive shaft and it has basically caused this to put torque on the wheels and the spring is basically taking that torque. You might remember some of your Camaros had a long brace going from the differential up here that hooked to the car body and that was to keep this thing from twisting and tearing itself out from under the car you know, on a really uh, high-powered uh, engine and all that. Anyway, uh, that pretty well winds us up on the video today, and I appreciate you guys watching, and I hope you got something out of it. This isn't like the ones I usually do, but I really appreciate all of the loyal fans that I have, or the ones that seem to be loyal. And I'll be talking to you guys next time. Leave me a comment, a like, tell some of your friends about the channel, and we'll talk to you later.